Hello there everybody and welcome to my beginner's guide for Jacked Alliance 3. In this video I'm going to give you a overview about all the features in the game, how they work and a little bit of this and that, what I collected in my hours of experience to get you a nice start into the game. So this video is made for people who have no clue how it works or just want to give themselves an impression if they would like the game or not. So. First things first, I have set up a team here for you, and you can directly copy that if you'd like to. It's a balanced team, it has everything you would require for combat, and it's quite cheap, and therefore we're going to talk about their special uh, specialties a little bit later too. But now I want to just keep it like that and get started with the actual game. So here, that's the strategic layer. I'm going to explain that after we've been in the tactical map, because I feel like the things that are happening here are way more interesting when we have seen what happens in those sectors. So with this button, I just started the time and we're watching, we were watching our mercenaries to arrive here. So we go now into that battlefield and this is where the game is actually um, happening. So WASD controls the camera just like you would think with the mouse wheel you go in and you go out and the first thing to note is if you press O you go into tactical view. That's uh, as you might notice here a little bit more um, bird's eye view. Since the game has a lot of eye candy, oh by the way if you hold the middle mouse wheel um, you can just uh, rotate, very important. Also with Q and E. So I like the tactical view because it just gives you the opportunity to just um, be a little bit less distracted by the visual glory. And last but not least, if you ever have problems with uh, walls of buildings, like for example here, pressing Ctrl H and holding it will remove those uh, visual barriers. Okay, so much about the controls. So tilde key selects your entire team or you can just drag and drop a rectangle over them. Right-clicking moves them, that's pretty much it. If you smack tap once, you will mark things that you can interact with permanently. It looks like that. So, watch these two guys. So if you have tab off, it looks like this. If you have tab on, it looks like that. This is quite important to see all the loot all the time, because there's a lot of stuff to loot. Therefore, you want to cra crawl into every corner of the map. So. There will be, whenever you can, loot something, it will be highlighted, so don't you worry. And uh, as soon as your soldiers give you this little warning, and you see that eyeball here, it's time to press H and go into hiding mode. Whenever you see enemies anywhere, instantaneously go into hiding mode. This puts your mercenaries into crouching position, which makes them harder to hit, and they're somewhat resistant to explosive damage with that too and the enemy has a harder time spotting them. So here's the next very important thing. F5 is quick save and use it a lot. F9 is quick load, you will also use it a lot. So before we go on over there to get our squad into position for that fight, I did do a quick save and I do quick save a ton in this game. So you will do so too probably unless you're playing Iron Man. So now we're going to talk about how to initiate a fight. I'll go and uh, explain ranged and melee combat in this video, but we're going to start with ranged combat. So we're going to pick up Raider, because he's the most experienced person in the squad. And as you see here, there's this enemy here. There's a red exclamation mark, and that is a indicator that somebody will spot you. I'll show you one more time. You see that red bar here filling up beneath Raider's portrait? When that bar is full, the enemy has successfully spotted him and will attack him. So this is happening because this guy is looking into Raider's direction. You can now put your mercenary into a prone position and they'll crawl on over there. And let's try that again and you will, my, you will note the difference. For one, you're moving like a snail. And the other thing is, well, all right, he's not uh, looking into my direction anymore, but the gist of it is, it makes you stealthier. So let's quick save one more time and let's talk about shooting. So when you are not spotted, the game is completely real time. You cannot pause it unless you download a mod for that. Then you can make the game go all Baldur's Gate on you and you just hit the space bar and pause happens. Unless you install that mod though, it will be all real-time, therefore, so, 
as you see here, the guy is spotting me again. While I'm prone, he's not spotting me because I'm completely disappearing behind that cover. So we're going to talk about shooting now. So when you're shooting, I hope this guy now, oh, look at it. He's now not, no longer possible. He's no longer able to see me. So when you're shooting down here, you see that range meter. It's a very simple thing. The middle uh, mark here, that's the optimal range for your current gun. This little uh, mark here shows what kind of range the shot will be and the current uh, circumstances. So short, you want to be with that mark in the lower 50% half. And when you right click, you invest action points. That's basically the actions you can do per turn. Then you can aim. And as you see here, over here, you also see a little bit of a summary about what's happening here. Since this is a stealth attack, it has a chance to instantaneously kill the enemy. And to sum up the ranged rules, since Jack the Lions 3 doesn't show you the hit percentage chances, if a shot looks like this, with maximum aiming you have a decent chance to hit it, as long as the marksmanship skill of your mercenary and his dexterity are decent. And if the shot exceeds that mark severely, chances are getting slimmer and slimmer. If the shot is at the end of this and even flashing red, don't even try. So. When you're shooting at the enemy, you get to select where you want to shoot him. By the way, also with melee weapons, the same. Torso shot is a vanilla shot, and all the other body parts have different side effects. Arms make the enemy inaccurate, groin does cost you some action points, legs makes you slow, and head is just a lot of damage. All of the other body parts, except for the torso, are harder to hit. So if you want to deal extra damage in a conservative way, you go for the groin. If you want to one-shot people, you go for the head. If you want to take a safe shot, you go for the torso. And uh, arms and legs are, well, circumstantial debuffs that are sometimes really good on bosses and stuff like that. Okay, so now we know the rules about shooting. That's pretty much all. Let's see if we can take a stealth takedown here. There we go. As you see, we instantaneously killed the guy, but the gunshot attracted the other folks. That's always the case. If a gun pops in the vicinity, the other dudes want to look what has happened. So, now we understood the basics of ranged combat. Now I want to go into the basics of melee combat real quick, and then we go over a real combat situation with these two blokes over there. So, melee is working like that. So, you have the ability in melee to first up bark an enemy when you're still stealth so now i get to select where i want to attack the guy i'm going to go for the groin because that's a pretty safe uh, bet and then you just move your melee character there you just ignore the fact that he's getting spotted and stab big advantage of that is this way as you see here these guys weren't alerted and we can just continue that so I'm going to show you real quick how that'll work. So we go in there. This is interesting out of a particular sit Because I wanted to show you that melee in the turn-based uh, part. So we now know how to do this in stealth. And this is the turn-based combat. We're going to talk about ranged combat here too in a second. But I want to continue you with the melee. So when the enemy has spotted you, you can just go for a melee strike here. You can also brutalize the enemy, that is, uh, specialty attacks exist for most weapons. Brutalize is a specialty attack of melee, pistols have a specialty attack, and so on and so forth. We're going to go for a standard melee strike. So as you see here, we see now the costs of that attack, and we're going to go for another groin stab. As you see here, the guy is not down yet. So we're going to go for an unnamed torso stab afterwards. Dude is down, and now the most important thing, always end your turn in cover. So we put our mercenary back here, put him into crouching, and now, if this guy wants to shoot him, he either has to flank him, and he has less shots then, or he takes a shot from this position and there's a very low chance of hitting him. So, let's reload that, because I want to do the same combat with guns. Because, you know, melee is very simple, actually. So we're going to give Igor the um, opportunity to take down this guy silently. And uh, we're going to take a gunfight with the other guys here. So let's hope he does it as well as the last time. He did. So when you're going for a gunfight, while you're in the hidden position, it really pays off to position your guys 
behind cover as good as you can. The nasty part about this is the game doesn't exactly tell you where cover is before the combat has started. You see, in combat you will notice a lot of blue shield icons that depict where you can hide, but, uh, well, you don't get these. So we're going to start the combat with Livewire before the enemy uh, spots us. So we missed. It was worth it, uh, an attempt. Not an ideal um, stealth attack. So. Thank you, Livewire. So over here you see the action points of your squad mates for this turn. This is the actions they can take. As you notice, the shot she has taken is basically already all her action points for this turn, so we're putting her prone, so the enemy has even a harder time of hitting her now. So if we want to get closer to the enemy, we need to move our soldiers. As you see here, there's blue squares and white squares. The blue squares indicate how far I can move and still take a shot. If I move inside these white squares, I will not be able to fire the currently uh, wielded gun, so that's that. And as I, uh, like I said, the handguns here has a specialty attack, the mobile shot, which basically allows me to move over here and then attack out of that position. That being said, we don't really want to get any attention of these guys right now. Our soldiers are currently hidden. They only know about Livewire's position. So we're going to use another maneuver you should really know about, Overwatch. So Overwatch allows you to put down a cone. And inside this cone, the enemy will get attacked if they move inside that cone, basically. So we're going to set up a few Overwatch cones here. Because I expect the enemy to move there. With Overwatch is always about um, considering where the enemy will go. And also, by the way, here notice these shields. There's a half shield. That means you only get cover if you are crouched. Some spots have a full shield. Looks like that. This means you're in cover even if you're standing. Very important to note. Also, it's important that to note that the cover has to be in the correct direction. So putting Barry now over here wouldn't really protect him from any fire out of that angle. No, it would be not. So we're currently not really able to put Barry into any um, beneficial angle cover-wise. So whatever I'll do will be a risky move. But whatever, we're going to take a little bit of risk. He is still hidden. The enemy does not know about him. So we can take that. And same goes for Fox. Basically, we're trying to set up an ambush here. There we go. Let's end the turn. As you see here, these guys are now marching into a square of... The, or a cone valley of death. And this is uh, how you can rule out fights quite often. You set up one person as decoy, and then you lure the enemy into your overwatch. Of course, there's a lot of different ways how you can do it. So let's put up a live wire there, and let's give her a satisfying finale for that. We're moving her up here. And move and uh, run and gun. Okay, so that's the basics about combat. Of course, there's a lot of uh, more intricate maneuvers here. Take cover, I want to mention here, because it's really good. You can use that whenever you're in cover, and it is a maneuver which allows you to transfer your AP into the next turn. So you can decide to either go for Overwatch, that's the aggressive waiting turn, and Take Cover is the passive waiting turn, which allows you to take enormous amounts of actions in the next turn, so you can really dish out a lot of shots there. Okay. So, stuff you can plunder here looks like that. You just left click it and then you go for that. I highly recommend you to um, plunder the map as hard as you can. So, one more thing about combat. We're pressing C here to go into the um, tab there. And here we see the stats of our mercenaries. In combat, really important to note, marksmanship is how good you can fire your gun. Dexterity is how much bonus accuracy you get from aiming and how good you can stealth kill. Agility is how good you can sneak and the total amount of action points. Very, very important. Health, well, that goes without saying, I guess. Strength is melee damage, but also personal inventory space. And wisdom is learning speed and finding hidden items. One last word about explosives. 
don't lob bombs without any with skill with people that are unskilled at explosives. There's a fairly high chance that these dudes will just throw the bomb somewhere where you don't want it. That's the best case. Worst case, right in the middle of your team or at their feet. So explosives are really easy to understand. You just uh, use the skill down here in the bar and then you just left click. And even a pro like him does have the chance to have mishaps. So mishap chance low does not mean that there is no mishap chance. It basically depicts the um, probability that something will go bad. And the higher the explosive skill, the lower the probability. Okay, so I want to go real quick about the equipment system here. Pressing I gets you there. Every mercenary can have two suits of guns. Highly recommend you to use that. Mix and match to your own liking. All guns can be modified. You right click them, you select modify, and then you can put decent new modifications on them. Comes even with mod with graphical um, things. So these modifications are paid with parts. Every weapon can be scrapped into parts. You right click it and you scrap it. You will also find parts. But all the excess weapons should be scrapped into parts in this game. Also armor can be scrapped. Pretty important to know. So that being said, you will have a lot of different options. So the secondary sets are really important. And what's also really important, guns have quality. So if the quality goes too low, the weapon will have a high likelihood of jamming. If armor goes low, it will, well, dissolve into nothingness at some point. So that's something to watch out for. If a weapon ever gets jammed, try to unjam it with somebody who has a high mechanical skill because otherwise there's a li high likelihood that the weapon will be damaged even more. One word about medicals. If somebody is wounded, you can bandage them. If somebody is bleeding, bandage them ASAP because that's really important. And therefore, these bandage packs are not only effective on your best doctor, ideally everybody with a doctoring skill above 20 or something like that should have a first aid kit. They are um, reloaded, their ammo is basically meds, and since bleeding is a damage over time effect that's quite deadly, you should be equipped for that. Okay, so apart from that, it's now up to you to explore the map and loot everything and speak with NPCs and uh, go through all the adventures. There's not much to explain there. I just want to note that the characters you bring have all different impact on the uh, solutions there. So you will have lots of differences with every playthrough. I will not go deeper into that, you just go move to these guys and just click them and go through the dialogue. That's that. There's not much to explain. What's important to note though when you're moving through areas here, oh well, let's click real quickly through that, there are hidden items and um, these hidden items are really really important that you go through them because that's why you bring people with high wisdom with you. As you see here, there's something you can hack gain money and intel from that and there's sometimes also just uh, funny things like this uh, chair and yeah well the world is quite interactable mesh uh, grids can be um, mesh wire thingies can be um, cut down there's a lot of cool things that you can go for okay I'm pressing M now and go into the tactical view this is where you will conquer the world so Real quick explanation, the currently selected squad can be moved by just left clicking a sector and just left clicking it again will create the movement order. If you shift left click, you can place waypoints so you can di dictate a certain movement. Also, you can do operations here. So if somebody is wounded, you can treat him here. You can scout the area and gain intel about the environment. And most importantly, you can repair items here. So if your gear gets worn down here in this screen, you can repair it. Also, you can train your mercenaries in whatever you want. So you can change the stat they get trained in and mercenaries can train each other to get better at things. So some people are quite bad and certain fields like Livewire, she's a quite bad shot, but she's quite dexterous and she has a high wisdom. So it would pay off to give her some marksmanship training to make her better, all these things. 
Certain locations have certain operations, so keep an eye out on new things that you can't do there. So in cities you can't do other things than here out there in the wilds. Okay, what's left to say? Out here, this are, these are enemies, these are fortresses of the enemy. These shields are little mini quests you need to resolve to lower the defenses, and I highly recommend to attack these places with no shields or one shield tops because it's a lot harder if you don't. Then there's also diamond mines. They look, they have a diamond icon. Here's one. <laughs> Sadly not shown yet because we haven't resolved the Battle of Erni yet. But uh, diamond mines will give you a steady income. Cities get uh, are ought to be conquered to get the trust of the local people, which makes the diamond mines even more lucrative. And at the end of the day, your job is to rescue the president of Gracian. Okay, so that's that. I want to talk about mercenary recruitment real quick. You press C to get into that screen here. So if you want to recruit a new mercenary, you will find them here in the AIM database. They cost you a lot of money and they have all different perks. I will not go over these. The team that I set up here, I will go over real quick because the rest will follow. So. Mercenaries have different skill sets. So she Fox here, for example, is a skilled doctor, but she's also a pretty decent shot. And every mercenary is more than these numbers here. They come with perks. The blue perk is a unique character trait, which has unique skills. For example, Fox gets her action points back if she attacks out of stealth, which is an amazing trait because everybody else is quite in a problematic situation if he's missing the first shot and the enemies even get uh, aware of her uh, slower. So Fox serves in this team as a uh, hybrid between fighter and doctor. Lifewire is your me dedicated mechanic. She repairs your guns, she modifies your guns, and she does all the mechanical um, little incidents in between. She also happens to be a pretty decent uh, doctor, so she can bandage people quite well. and. She's very squishy, so take care of that. Her perk is to visualize enemies, which you have intel for in the sector, which is quite amazing because that replaces sight. And she also comes with a couple of other perks, which help her repairing stuff. And she's also a scoundrel, which adds in additional conversation options. Each of these perks, by the way, gives you the opportunity to resolve quests differently. Now then, our friend Igor here is for in for the damage. He's replaceable. You could go for somebody else. I picked him up because he's cheap and effective. He has a lot of HP. He's good at melee and ranged. He's a, bit, a little bit uh, mediocre in these departments, but his big sales point is that he comes with a skill that gives him 25 temporal HP called grit and more melee damage for that. He does shoot worse because he's drunk then but if you want to play a melee this is an amazing skill because he immediately goes tank mode with that and the other wonderful thing is he also gains grit due to this perk when he does a successful melee attack so igor is really hard to kill and hard to wound apart from that he does not have too many uh, cool abilities except for being stealthy and he's cheap did i already mention that he's cheap Barry is your explosives expert. He's also darn cheap. He is a mediocre shot. Again, dexterity is okay. Marksmanship is not so much. But his explosive skill is amazing. And he manufactures specialty bombs, which are a little bit more unreliable, but amazingly powerful. And he's pretty good at mechanical, so he can unjam guns in a uh, if ever a pressing matter occurs and he gets a free move after lobbing a grenade so he can be up front throw a bomb and run it back raider is your leader your most costy guy he excels at fighting marksmanship and dexterity are decent all the other skills are all over the board pretty good too he has even a shooting perk he gets to revenge attack if he's getting shot at which makes him a pretty good tank he gets to go prone for free and he deals more damage for two flanked enemies but raider is with you because of leadership in jack alliance 3 you can train militias which will defend your sectors and leadership makes you faster at training that but there is also a hidden perk behind leadership that allows you to move faster a high leadership uh, guy 
gives you extra squad speed. So with Raider, your squad will be always darn fast. So you can hire everybody you want on this roster. Some people are temporarily available, uh, unavailable like these. And if you don't manage to set up the starting team as you'd like to, if you want to rebuild this one, you just have to restart your um, game. Just press new game one more time and re-roll until you have people available that you want. But technically I have already told you enough that you can go for your own composition. I personally just think it's really important that your team has at least one doctor, one medical professional, one explosives professional, and ideally somebody with leadership. The rest is up to you. I just want to point out that if you want to go for a completionist run, you should pick up the ne negotiator trait for the additional conversational options and the psycho trait for the additional conversational options as well as the scoundrel. There is also another thing, there's the IMP. You can log in here and pay 7,000 bucks and then you get to create yourself a custom mercenary. You get to select the perks as you want them to and most importantly you can also pick the personality perks that you're missing. So if you want to go for a mercenary or you don't know how to fit in the perks that you want to, you can make yourself a custom one here too. Okay, so I think that was pretty much all I had to say. I just want to mention two things or two or three things at the end here. First off, ammunition in this game can grow quite scarce. Not for handguns and stuff like that. 9mm bullets are all over the world, but some guns have less ammo than others. This is a way of balancing for the game. So basically, if a gun is stupidly powerful, always double check how many bullets you have for it, because the likelihood the chances are high that you don't have too many because the game loves to lower the total amount of bullets for you. To amend that problem, there are workshops in the game, I'll spoiler you, here's one, which allows you to transform gunpowder into bullets of your choice. You also can craft explosives at these. Therefore, if you find gunpowder, this is what you can do with it. Another thing, you should always pressure forward to diamond mines. Your first objective is to conquer Erni Island. After that, you should go for diamond mines. There's one here in this ver uh, vicinity of Flea Town, and there's one up north here, which has no town connected to it. The A2 diamond mine is a pretty hard fight at the beginning, but it has the advantage that it has a stupidly high income, which does not require loyalty from the surrounding city. It's up to you if you want to have a challenging fight go for it, otherwise the Fleet Town mine is way easier to conquer, but the full income of that is harder to achieve. That being said, always be conservative with your income, because two things. First off, as long as you have no diamond mines, you are totally relying on loot, and that's you never know when the next loot will come by, when you're new that is. And the other thing is, diamond mines will eventually run dry, therefore, your objectives in this game should be always oriented around conquering a diamond mine after another so your cash won't run dry. So that's been that. I hope you have now a proper first impression about that. And if there are any questions or if you feel like I left out something very important, let me know in the comment section and I'll see what I can do. That being said, Thanks for watching a lot. Thanks for your time. I hope you enjoy this game. Leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to the channel if you want to help me out. It does so ton. And there's also a playlist link down there to all the other Jack the Lines info videos I did. So have a wonderful day. Thanks for watching yet again and see you soon.